Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's episode of Simon's Book Club, where every month we'll be reading and discussing fascinating books on psychology, well-being, neuroscience, and consciousness. And by every month, you and I both know that that is very highly optimistic. I haven't done one of these videos in six months. I believe that I have, at long last, finally been able to set up a system for myself in being creative, one that works, and I've got a better understanding of how I feel about my creative goals, which is resulting in me getting a bit of my groove back now. During my last video on my trip to France, like that really felt good for me. And I think that I'm in a space to get back to creating videos about the ideas that I find really transformative. And I hope that you find them interesting as well. So this month's book is a bit of a departure from the rest of the books that I've covered so far. I'm talking about Bell Hooks's All About Love, which isn't very sciencey and lacks a lot of the scientific rigor that the other books possess, but it really felt like the right book to read for February, back when I started reading this book for a second time, because it was winter back then. It's almost fall now. Uh, and it was the month of love, and it kind of marked the one-year anniversary of a major challenge that I've undertaken. So let's talk about that first. The first time I read this book was in February of 2021, when I was still reeling from my divorce. While in my marriage, I actually thought I knew a thing or two about love, and I thought of myself as a good husband. Truly, truly did. Uh, but it turns out that I was very f***ing wrong about that. The reviews are in, and they don't look good. Zero out of ten would not recommend. So, I found myself uh, in a profound sense of self-doubt, which led me to question everything that I previously took for granted. All of this uncertainty pointed to me that I might just be fundamentally broken in some way and better off on an island by myself where I wouldn't be hurtful to anyone. So that was the stage of my life where I found this book and I felt a very deep connection with Bell Hooks and what she was saying. Even though we have very different cultures and upbringings, I really found myself relating with the author in other ways since she too was in a very long relationship that ended and left her feeling very confused about love and relationships afterwards, which I'm sure is a common experience, one that some of you might be able to relate to as well. I, I know you do. I've read some of the messages you sent and reading about how you've been able to heal and how the author was able to heal as well provided me with hope in my own possible healing. I felt very encouraged um, by Bell Hooks not closing herself off to love, as I've seen in some of the divorced men that I know. Instead, she went all in on love and threw herself into learning about love. And as a result of her dedication to the art of loving, she's written one of the most famous books about love of all time. Even Childish Gambino like mentions her in a song. To practice the art of loving, we have first to choose love, to admit to ourselves that we want to know love and be loving, even if we don't know what that means. Amen to that. And I found that very inspiring. And so I soaked this book up. Mm. I ate up all of those ideas, mm -hmm. I read it, I digested it, and I came back for seconds and thirds. Totally love this book. Bell Hooks writes about where she learned unhealthy ideas of love from her family of origin and from the culture that she grew up in. And she really, with great focus and very clear writing, she undoes a lot of the messaging that she grew up with, a lot of the messaging that was part of my beliefs about love as well. Because, after all, where did my beliefs about love and relationships come from? It's not something that's built into us from birth. We don't have behaviors of romantic relationships coded into our DNA, right up there with how to build proteins. There's no sequence that dictates how I should communicate with a romantic partner. No, no, not at all. I was taught these ideas from somewhere. So where and how? And do those ideas actually serve me? Well, they clearly, clearly f***ing didn't. They're bad form. So let me look into other forms. This book offered me a new form, a framework with which I felt that I could learn how to love well, 
with ideas that are more studied, ideas that make more sense, ideas that are in line with my goals of living a life of compassion. At the same time, it provided me with many ideas with which I could deeply examine and question all of the ways in which I've experienced love, both romantically and amongst my friends and family, with really well-worded quotes that I could repeat to myself. Really, I love her writing style. And more than that, Hooks offers some guidelines that I could follow and really challenging prompts for self-reflection that I could take with me and journal about for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And more than that, Bell Hooks inspired me on this new path of love that I was determined to follow. So some people take up new exercise routines after a divorce, or some people took up bread making over the pandemic. Maybe, maybe you did too. I took up a different challenge and I took it very seriously. How could I live with love as my core ethic? How could I be great at love? For real, I really wanted to learn. And with that, how would my actions and relationships be different from before? Step one, take on a very breathy namaste voice. No, no, that's not the first step, but it helps. Give it a shot. Um... After reading all about love, I went to the bibliography at the back of the book and read some of the books that Hooks refers to often. Uh, the most profound one, being Frum's Art of Loving, which is also a very famous book about love. So check it out. It's really great stuff. In that book, Frum asks us to take loving very seriously and to treat love with the same focus and dedication that an artist does with their art or as a professional athlete does with their sport, and then to see how their worldview changes when that happens. Take love seriously. Make an art out of it. If LeBron James is training for basketball all the time, how can I spend my time training in love? And after all that training, just kind of like how a musician who has been making music for a decade will interact with the world differently and get more out of their daily experience so that they hear music hiding in the rustling of the leaves or the tweeting of birds or in the rumble of train tracks. The more that you are in your craft, the more you kind of see it everywhere around you. I found this a very curious challenge since I can say from my experience of being someone who's been making YouTube videos since 2008, well over a decade now, that when I'm experiencing a special moment, I think about it cinematically. How would I frame this on camera and what lens would work for me here and what soundtrack fits the mood? And so I figure that if I approached love with that same drive and focus that I put towards video making and I committed myself towards putting effort in my craft of loving, that I would see the world differently through this new lens of love as well. So what does that training look like? I threw myself into the project and I approached it from very many different angles. I started with a lot of self-compassion work through an eight-week course on self-compassion, which I highly recommend, and I'll share the link in the info box below. Check it out. Uh, and by continuing the practices that I learned from those classes afterwards and carrying them on into today. I also really got into the works of Kristen Neff and Christopher Germer, who are really on the forefront of self-compassion research. It's not just all woo-woo that I'm talking about. I'm trying to read stuff backed by science and peer-reviewed research. I also got a lot deeper into Buddhism and I developed a regular practice of metta meditation, which is also known as loving kindness meditation. Sharon Salzberg is really inspiring in this field and so was the Dalai Lama. I also looked more into the Bodhisattva texts and I memorized some passages that I could repeat to myself regularly. I also read a whole bunch about attachment theory, particularly in the works of Amir Levine, who I think has the most accessible and popular book on the subject. I know a lot of people who know that book. Uh, and so I got a lot deeper into it and I also read some of the other research papers on attachment theory and I worked on understanding my own patterns of both anxious and avoidant attachment and in trying to develop more patterns for secure attachment style. Oh yeah, nerdy <laughs> uh, I also took a class at University of Toronto on the psychology of relationships and I learned a lot about the most up-to-date theories and the research on relationships. It's 
a really cool class. I also got a bit more granular and I focused a lot of my time in reading about how emotions are made and what chemicals our bodies feel when we're in love and what situations those chemicals get released, which seems kind of unromantic. I, I know, I know. But love feels like something. What is that feeling in the body and how does that happen? I think it's worth looking into. I also got super interested into nonviolent communication and I saw how it unlocked compassion and I changed the way that I speak all together so that my choice of words and speech patterns don't get in the way of staying connected with people, of staying mindful and remaining open and compassionate. And this, it's a game changer for me. And those are just a few things. Honestly, I'm not trying to come across as pedantic here, which I'm sure some of you might be thinking, but I can't control what you're thinking and feeling. But truly, since reading all about love, I've really taken this challenge to heart and living a life with a love ethic has been my major focus and how I spend a significant chunk of the hours of my day over the past two years. Yeah, instead of learning any employable skills over these past two years, I studied love. Good choice, Simon. You could really get a job out of that one. Yep. <clears throat> and since starting this new way of living, I've been in love and I have been loved a few times. And now, currently in a loving relationship, I'm coming to this book for my third reading, now with a very different mindset from when I started reading this back in February. I feel a lot more comfortable in my understanding of love. I feel that I could participate in it consciously, safely, and healthily, though I do know, I still know, that I have a lot of investigating to do. So this was all inspired after reading Frum's The Art of Loving, which I learned about from Hooks' All About Love, and most of everything that I talked about is outside of the scope of All About Love. So let's talk about what's between the covers a little bit more and some of the ideas that are now a major part of my current worldview. So my most profound takeaway from the book was that I didn't naturally know how to be in a loving relationship, but I just imitated what I saw in my family of origin, along with what I saw depicted in TV and media and how none of those especially in the media, necessarily showed me very healthy examples of relationships or any good examples to follow. It was a very convincing point, especially for me, coming at the tail end of my relationship and being so doubtful of myself and my ability to love. And later on in my journey, the more that I got into studying and learning about relationships, the more I had the language and the ideas that helped this point make sense. I mean, how often do we see the romanticization of anxious attachment styles in the media? Really, far too often. How often did I see patterns of healthy communication amongst equals in loving relationships? For real, almost never. I don't know a single TV show or movie that does that. A lot of the dialogue in loving relationships that I've seen depicted on TV is very violent and judgmental, sarcastic or critical, and doesn't really show us how to hold space for others. It doesn't show us how to be compassionate in conversation or how to listen to each other without quick and funny retorts. I've seen much more screen time dedicated to the depictions of strife than to the depictions of harmony, and I'm pretty sure you have too. And again, since we don't naturally know how to be in relationships, if we see bad ones all around us, then monkey see, monkey do. I truly hope that your experiences are different from mine, but examples for how to love well, for me, were very few and far between. Hell, I can't really think of any healthy examples of loving relationships that I've seen growing up at all. I love you, mom and dad. I know you're watching this, and I know you agree with me here. And if I've just been imitating what I've seen, as we all do, then I found it really worthwhile to examine my patterns, my responses, the ways that I express love, the way I act in relationships, and to question all of these patterns and to see if they are in line with this love ethic that I currently want to live. Because previously, they weren't. But now, being more aware and with being given examples and guidelines of how to live healthily, I can make choices about how to act and feel in the future. I'm not doomed to repeat all that I've seen around me. 
I can create something new from a different foundation and from a different set of principles. And I found that idea very liberating. And I still do. The next point for me came with the author's dislike of the idea of falling in love, which at first sounds shocking, like falling in love. That's one of the best parts of love, isn't it? I mean, look at all the movies and the songs about it. The end of so many romantic movies is that the couple finally, finally gets together and then they live happily ever after, as if the challenge of just starting the relationship is a major one that they'll face as a couple when a lot of the times it's the easiest challenge that they're going to face. Bell Hooks points out how interested we are in this idea of falling in love and how much that's a bad idea. Toni Morrison identifies the idea of romantic love as one of the most destructive ideas in the history of human thought. Its destructiveness resides in the notion that we come to love with no will and no capacity to choose. This illusion, perpetuated by so much romantic lore, stands in the way of our learning how to love. To sustain our fantasy, we substitute romance for love. Mm-hmm. Yup. Love and romance are not the same thing. And romantic lore is so disempowering when it comes to love, with this idea of falling into love. But what about walking in love? What about standing in love? Here's another good quote. If you don't know what you feel, then it's difficult to choose love. It is better to fall. Then you do not have to be responsible for your actions. Ooh, yep. That's, that's a big one there. So often, falling in love is something out of our control. It's something that happens to us, something that comes over us passively as a passion when things click and the stars align. But what about a love that's in our control? What about love as an action, as an activity, as something that we actively do? A good question to ask is, how do we give love? How do we act with love rather than just have it happen to us? How do we choose love and not just wait for it to be found? So, hell yeah, bell hooks. I was really inspired by the idea, as I so often thought of love as just based on feeling strongly towards someone and those feelings were out of my control. But now, I see myself as someone that can choose love, that I could generate the feelings associated with love intentionally and with anyone. I don't have to wait for it to happen. I can love at a moment's notice. Mr. Rogers is a great source of inspiration for me, as I hope he is for you. Uh, and my favorite idea of his is that we can fall in love with anyone if we just listen to the story. Give someone a chance. Truly connect with what's alive inside of them, and you could feel love towards them. So with these first two ideas from Bell Hooks, I felt completely disarmed. I was just broken wide open and ready to take in whatever idea she offered for a new way to view love. Not only did I feel from a lived experience that I sucked at love, but now I was getting a detailed explanation, a breakdown, and reading good reasons explaining why I sucked at love. So I spoke about the framework and the guiding principles that this book offers. So let me kind of lay them out for you here now. So Hooks offers a couple definitions of love and I soaked them up. I memorized them and I held on to them dearly from then on out. And I share their definition just about every time I get into a talk about love with everyone. They're kind of annoyed by it now. So the first definition is that love is to expend effort to facilitate your own and your partner's spiritual growth. Think of it like tending to a garden and giving it the support of an environment in which it can flourish. You want the person that you are loving to grow, to be happy, fulfilled, and to flourish into their best selves. I hope you do, at least. Now, that's not much of a framework as much as kind of like a guiding ethos. And it's really the second definition that Hooks offers is the one that really gives me the most practical advice. So here it is. Love is a mixture of a few ingredients. There's six of them. Now let's count them out and remember them all together. Here we go. To be loving, you need affection, care, trust, recognition, respect, commitment, and the last one, open and honest communication. Remember those six. That last one is a whole video into itself, which I will do in the future, but 
briefly, uh, let me just share this. Open and honest communication is often blocked by violent communication. When we criticize or judge, shame, complain, correct, advise, abuse, and we speak about what's wrong with others as opposed to what's alive within us. But that's another video for another day. So that right there is how I tend to my garden of love and water the plants. Back to Hooks' definition of love, I determined that I would offer these six ingredients in every loving relationship I be in from then on out. And that's not exclusive to my romantic partners. I offer as many of those ingredients as I can to my friends and to my family and even to people that I don't know that I interact with. Though my level of commitment with each person is different because there just isn't enough hours in the day for me to love everyone like this and still somewhat function in the world. You can't be fully committed to everybody on the streets. Now, many of us are in relationships where we experience some of those ingredients, like care and affection, but many of the other ingredients are missing. Respect and trust are missing in a lot of sexist romantic relationships with stereotypes of how a man or woman should act or ageist family relationships where we treat elders differently from how we treat children. And healthy communication is something in particular that, from my experience, I've seen lacking in just about all relationships except for a very rare few. Care and affection are very easy to depict in movies and TV, but good dialogue between two loving people where one partner holds space and offers compassion so that the other partner can explore their trigger safely without getting into an activating feedback loop with each other is something that I've yet to see any writer skillfully handle. Hell, I think that might not even make sense for some of you watching this video as well. It's gobbledygook. Conflict is so much easier to show. If it bleeds, it leads. And that seems to be the default state for many. So these thoughts on how romantic relationships aren't something that we innately know how to do, but simply mimic from the patterns of others was a really big idea for me to chew on. But bigger still was the idea of what influences these patterns to begin with. And this will be my last point, so let's talk about that for a bit, and then you'll be free. <laughs> so Hooks writes a lot about greed, and her most salient point here is that Capitalism and consumerism are prominent ethics that influence our romantic patterns. In other words, we love like the good capitalist consumers that we are, and we are shopping for a partner. So one idea to chew on for a bit is, for starters, our lovers aren't our lovers. They aren't people that are ours to own. We don't possess them, like our language indicates when we say that this is my man, my woman, my boyfriend, my wife. People are people. They're not ownable. They're not truly ours. And this language trap of ownership is something that we should question before we start taking it too literally. Now I know that last point might face some resistance, so let me just gloss over that real quick with a wave of my hands. Ta-da! Now you could take that idea or leave it, but just chew on it for a bit. I think it's useful. For now, let's explore some other capitalist and consumerist patterns in romance. So to do this, Hook suggests a couple of points for us to just accept as granted at first, and if you come along with those points for the ride, then the logical conclusion is actually really interesting. So let's, let's follow along here. So the first point, many of us are very uncomfortable with our emotions, and we don't have healthy ways to get our emotional needs met. I think that you can agree with this. Even if you don't think it applies to you, I think you could look at many of the people around you who are kind of emotionally messy and they have unhealthy ways of processing their feelings or of trying to cover up and avoid what they're feeling. F I know, I know you know a few people like this, at least one, at least one. Okay, so that's the first point. On to the second point. Hooks suggests that in many ways, when we can't process our emotions well, like some of those people that you know, but aren't you, clearly, of course, then it's easy for us to try to feel nice by buying nice things. Kind of like, I don't feel so good right now, so let me buy a new iPhone. That's gonna feel nice. I, I know from personal experience that I felt like donkey sh at the start of my divorce, so I bought a Tesla, which was really cool and helped me avoid icky feelings sometimes. Sometimes. <clears throat> 
Yet, these things are just things, and while they feel great the first time we use them, we quickly, really quickly get accustomed to these things, and that great feeling we had the first time we used them doesn't feel the same the hundredth time we use them. We get bored of them, and eventually we find them lacking, so we need to find something newer and something that feels nice again. So the big conclusion here is this. Hook suggests that we often treat our relationships in the same way, as dispensable as the things we buy. We're looking for a quick fix partner, one that could read our minds and know all of our needs intuitively without us having to do the difficult work of articulating our needs. And when things aren't working out, instead of putting in the work to learn how to communicate better, to learn how to manage conflicts more effectively and how to safely deal with our triggers and theirs, Instead, what we do is dispose of our partners like we do an old phone and just try to find another one on the market. The economics of dating feels like especially salient with dating apps with the churn through a conveyor belt of potential partners. Tinder, Tinder's kind of weird. I was listening to Father John Misty recently and I heard him say that love is just an economy based on resource scarcity, which really feels just so... Ugh icky to think about and it's really the bottom of the barrel when we think about how capitalism influences how we love but when i think about how marriages used to be so economically driven back in the day with dowries and like the merging of powerful families and some potential suitors having better prospects than others then it's easy to see how relationships kind of have the smell of economics still on them which really taints the purity of the relationships that we really want to have in the history of humanity we haven't always thought about love and relationships the way we do now and i think it's important to think about how past conventions still have an impact on how we love today and how we might be engaging in our romantic relationships with those frameworks in mind. So though it's difficult to lay out a roadmap of how to love for love's sake without our old cultural patterns getting in the way, that's what Bell Hooks is really trying to offer in this book. And I think she nailed it. So for this video, I mostly talked about the major influences in our understanding of how to be in relationships and how they don't really lead to the most fulfilling kinds of love. And for me, after re-examining the influences in my understanding of love, I started to break free from my older patterns of loving and applying some new ideas in my relationships with my family, my friends, my romantic partners, and myself. So I'll tell you how I did so in part two of my video on my channel, Simon's Book Club. Um, it's in the info box below, click the link check it out. And now that I've shared how much of a fixation love has been for me over this past couple of years, a big part of that for me is constantly talking about love with my friends and with my family. And I'd really enjoy talking about it with you as well. I'd like to read some of your takes on what I've discussed here. So let me know, how has your definition of love changed over the years? How do you know that you're in love? Where do you feel love in your body? I remember falling in love again and being very mindful of what was happening to my body, to my arms and my hands, how I felt it, and I tried my best to describe it in detail. So I'd be curious to read how do you feel it in your body as well, and, and don't just say that you get a boner. And in what ways do you make a conscious effort to love? So share your comments here and come join the book club over on Discord where we could talk about this in a lot more depth. Yeah, we got a good group of people there. So come join me and I'll see you in part two of the video. And I finally, finally finished this video. Started this shit in February. It's almost, this will be September when this comes out. Ah, thank you everyone. I'll see you in part two. Mwah.